Sometimes we play games because they're interesting. Sometimes we play them because they inspire us or tell us a story that could only exist in this medium. Sometimes we play games to further the industry as a whole, or to show us that video games are just as versatile as movies, TV, and books. Sometimes we play them because we want to be part of the conversation, or because they engage and reflect poignant issues in these difficult times. But sometimes, sometimes, we play games just because they're fucking awesome. It's hard to believe, but it's been over 10 years since developer Platinum Games released Bayonetta on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Since then we've had a sequel exclusive to Nintendo platforms, with a third on the way, and ports to the Wii U, PC and Switch. Similarly, this October will mark the 10 year anniversary of another seminal cult classic from Platinum Games, the much loved third person shooter Vanquish. While possibly not quite the developer's best work, that honour is reserved for the unrivaled masterpiece that is Near Automata, in my eyes, Bayonetta and Vanquish represent two seminal entries in Platinum's library, and still stand as some of the best examples of their genres today. Luckily, this is a fact that publisher Sega also seems to be aware of, and on February 18th, the two games were re-released on current-gen consoles as a double pack for a budget price, bringing with them better performance and resolutions than any versions seen outside of the PC version thus far. For any out there who haven't played these two games, if you're a fan of great mechanics, over-the-top action, and super satisfying stylish gameplay, I can tell you right up front that this double pack is definitely worth your money. But for the sake of clarity, let's take a closer look at them both, shall we? Platinum Games was founded in October of 2007 as a merging of several smaller studios, all of which had been founded by ex-employees of Capcom. Shinji Mikami, Atsushi Iniba and Hideki Kamiya had founded a studio named Seeds Inc. after Capcom had closed Clover Studio, where the three had worked together alongside Tatsuya Minami, who had instead founded Odd Inc. Studios again after Clover's demise. The pedigree of games that have been produced between these four figures whilst at Capcom is somewhat mind-blowing. Inaba, Kamiya and Minami had worked on titles such as the wonderful cel-shaded action-adventure game Okami, as well as the refreshingly original Beautiful Joe. Also, as if that wasn't enough, Shinji Mikami is often considered the man responsible for the Resident Evil franchise, having directed several entries including the first and fourth game, both of which are commonly regarded as watershed titles in the survival horror landscape. Suffice to say, there was more than a little talent here. However, there was one franchise that we have yet to mention in the lineage of these developers, one with which the name Hideki Kamiya is associated, and it is one that many believe to have been a seminal moment for both Capcom and Sony's PlayStation 2 console. Devil May Cry would release in August of 2001, and would arguably change the action genre forever. While it reportedly started life as a version of Resident Evil 4 before evolving into its own beast, its fast-paced combat, over-the-top style and tone, and fluid action gameplay would give it its own identity, far removed from that of Capcom's flagship survival horror franchise. So why am I talking about Devil May Cry in this Bayonetta review? Well, while the DMC series would continue on to great success without Kamiya, many fans would see Bayonetta as a successor to the Demon Slaying classic, or at the very least, a sibling of sorts. And having now played it across its many releases and re-releases, I can see where they're coming from. Bayonetta tells the story of a witch who is trying to uncover her lost memories while fighting her way through demonic realms, angelic vistas and a version of modern day Europe in a fictional city named Vigrid. While it never takes itself too seriously and also often descends into the over the top ridiculousness that Platinum Games have now become known for, none of this ever really feels out of place and often simply serves to manoeuvre the story into a situation which allows for a new or interesting game mechanic or action sequence. It sort of feels like the team had all these crazy ideas for awesome action set pieces and then designed a story and setting that would allow them to exist without feeling forced. Such an observation can also be made of many of the game's characters, which are almost all over the top and ridiculously two-dimensional, but in an endearing way. 
Having said this, I would say that the story and characters are some of Bayonetta's weakest elements. While I've played through the game many, many times, they are not the parts that stick with me, and after my first playthrough, I found myself skipping the cutscenes and conversations, and even getting a little annoyed by some of the characters' eccentricities and character traits. This is often compounded by some overzealous voice acting that can grate in places, despite it feeling in keeping with the game's overall tone. I'm not exaggerating when I say that the combat in Bayonetta is some of the most satisfying, challenging, and incredible action game design I have ever seen in over 30 years of playing games. It's a system which has immediate pick up and play value, but also has a seemingly bottomless level of depth. I must have played through Bayonetta around 30 times now, from start to finish, if not more, and I'm still discovering new combos and techniques each time I play. The essential tenets of this system are the use of various weapons which can be hotkeyed and switched on the fly, the use of support items which can help augment various elements of combat, and the use of player movement including dodge timing which can afford the player extra advantages in combat. Add to this consumable items, outrageously satisfying execution moves, awe-inspiring combos, and a grading system for every encounter, and you have one of the best combat systems in gaming history. I know it sounds hyperbolic, but it really is that good, and stands alongside the likes of Devil May Cry as a top-tier example of the genre when it comes to action gameplay. Special commendation should also be given to the game's overall structure and difficulty gradient throughout both the first playthrough and subsequent difficulties. It's a game you can start on the easiest difficulty and then work your way up through the difficulties gradually, improving with each playthrough until you eventually wonder how you ever struggled. Moreover, the game is also packed with easter eggs and mechanics that reference publisher Sega's classic arcade library throughout its 10-12 to 12 hour duration. Such an addition are sure to please fans who might remember such a time with reverence and nostalgia. While some criticism can be levelled at the game's pacing in places, with slower or duller sections occasionally making you want to just get back to the action. Such a criticism is a minor one, and in the end does little to detract from the game's overall appeal. The game's score and sound are also great for the most part, outside of the aforementioned occasionally annoying voice performances. Sound effects are satisfying and clear, and the game's jazz meets J-pop soundtrack is one that is sure to divide, but also undeniably gives the game a very original vibe and tone. It's also worth speaking briefly about this particular port. While this is not a technical review by any means, and is instead focused on the games themselves, I can say that other than the PC version, this is the best place to play Bayonetta. If you never played it when it came out, or had the misfortune of playing the now infamously bad PS3 version, picking up this version is recommended, as it looks great and runs at a solid 60fps throughout. When all is said and done, Bayonetta is somewhat of a must-play for fans of the action genre. It's slick, satisfying, and confidently executed, and while it does have its problems, namely a forgettable story, occasionally annoying characters, and a few pacing issues, the good far outweighs the bad in this modern classic. If you've never played Bayonetta, or just have the itch to revisit The Witch, the PS4 or Xbox One versions are a no-brainer. But, as we know, even after Bayonetta, Sega were not quite done with Platinum games just yet. In fact, the publisher had contracted Platinum to make four games for them. So far, they had produced the mostly forgotten but still fondly remembered Wii-exclusive Mad World, the almost completely forgotten DS exclusive Infinite Space, and Bayonetta. So with one more title to go, what would Platinum pull out of the bag for Sega this time? The answer was one that many believe would do for the third person cover shooter what Bayonetta had done for action games. The answer was one that would embody Platinum's tone and style, but bring it to the shooter genre. The answer was Vanquish. Unlike Bayonetta, Vanquish would be directed by the aforementioned Mr. Resident Evil himself, Shinji Mikami. Mikami, who would go on to leave Platinum after Vanquish and go on to form Tango Gameworks, the studio behind the excellent Evil Within series, was arguably the perfect person for the director's chair, having already redefined the third-person action shooter once before in his career with Resident Evil 4. But Vanquish would share little of Resi 4's DNA, instead feeling like some sort of love child of Bayonetta and Gears of War. And what a glorious love child it is. Much like Bayonetta, the story here is not one that will stick with you, or one that really even matters much, to be honest. Set as a sort of strange and campy futuristic retelling of the Cold War, it concerns America and Russia's ongoing fight for resources and supremacy in an uncertain future, but with robots and stuff. There's nanotech, WMDs, chemical warfare, space battles, and many more crazy goings on in Vanquish's relatively short campaign. Essentially, melodrama and over-the-top action is the order of the day here, with characters that are somehow even more two-dimensional than those found in Bayonetta. But like Bayonetta, these are not really criticisms. 
And while the story is once again forgettable, fun nonsense, it never really feels out of place or frustrating, but instead feels like both a natural extension of the game's tone and a facilitator for its many crazy and awesome action set pieces. Unlike Bayonetta though, Vanquish does have a little more learning curve when it comes to its gameplay. While once the basics have been mastered, the sky's the limit, and approaching each conflict in different ways becomes the game's bread and butter. Such basics require a little more time to master. Don't get me wrong, it's not really a tough game to get the hang of, but it doesn't quite have the same instant pick up and play factor seen in its predecessor. Still, don't let such minor observations deter you. The gameplay here is some of the best in the third person genre, and as you get more proficient it only becomes more satisfying. Essentially, the gameplay comes down to mastering movement and power usage in various ways. The player can use what is referred to in-game as their augmented reaction suit to essentially slide around the area at great speeds, dodge incoming attacks, and expel powerful melee damage. The downside of this is that the suit will eventually overheat, limiting the player's movement, meaning the player must wait for it to recharge and try to avoid damage. On top of this, the suit also has what's known as AR mode, which serves as a focus mechanic, slowing time for a while to allow for greater accuracy. This mechanic can be triggered manually, will kick in if the player takes too much damage, or activates if the player aims during certain actions, such as vaulting cover. On top of this, Vanquish also has a varied collection of weapons, which can be upgraded throughout the game. Many of these are great fun to use, and when coupled with the player's limited carrying capacity, it forces you to weigh up your options consistently as you take on hordes of robots and larger boss-like enemies. Again, much like its predecessor, Vanquish also evokes the feeling of publisher Sega's past too, with its focus on scoring each chapter, precision aiming, and practiced repetition to master the game's techniques. While it's by no means an arcade game, it definitely shares some of that old-school Sega DNA, and it's all the better for it. Also, Vanquish has an appropriately synth-meets-metal soundtrack that really serves to amp up the game's action. Music seems to always kick in at just the right point to help you get amped up for the next challenge or battle. Despite this though, there is a minor criticism regarding the audio levels, as often the music can drown out the dialogue. While this can easily be changed in the options menu, it can be a little annoying at default setting. Voice acting wise, Vanquish is a game that delivers corny and over the top performances with a little less zeal than that of Bayonetta, and instead comes off more like a cheesy action movie. That said, this mostly feels appropriate for the game's tone, and while a little silly, never really gets in the way. However, it is sound effects where Vanquish shines brightest, with every weapon, overheat and reload sounding distinctively chunky and weighty. But while Vanquish is an outstanding game, it does have a few minor issues besides the aforementioned default audio level problem. Firstly, there's a reliance on quick time events in certain sections, which won't be to everyone's tastes. This was very common at the time of the game's release, and can actually also be seen in Bayonetta as well. But as with its predecessor, they're only used sparingly, and are nowhere near prevalent enough to ruin anything, even for the most anti-QTE player out there. Secondly, there are some frustrating mission types, including the bane of many shooters, the escort mission, which can be extremely agitating on higher difficulties. Also, it's worth noting that Vanquish can be a bit of a difficult game in general in places, and is one that I feel presents a little bit more of a challenge than Bayonetta. While this is in no way a negative or detrimental point, and many will enjoy the increased challenge, it's nevertheless worth knowing going in. Finally, the game's pacing can grow a little stale and slow in places, and while the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is always fun, there are a few peaks and troughs when looking at the game as a whole. Also, as a related point, it's worth noting that Vanquish is a much shorter experience than many of its contemporaries, and can be finished in around 5-6 to six hours. But such a fact actually does the game a disservice, as the dynamic nature of the gameplay engenders the need to consistently replay every section, approaching it differently each time. Such qualities actually mean the replay value is way above that of many games in its genre. And on top of the unlockable challenge modes, multiple difficulties, and in-game collectibles, there's plenty to keep you playing long after your first run through the campaign is complete. Despite some minor criticisms, Vanquish still stands as one of the best examples of the third-person cover shooter produced last generation. It's fun, interesting, dynamic, challenging, and above all else, unique. Also, much like its predecessor, this collection presents one of the best places to play it, with once again only the PC version displaying better levels of visual fidelity and performance. While it is the less successful and well-remembered of the two in this collection, I hope we haven't seen the last of Vanquish from Platinum. And while Bayonetta enjoys well-deserved sequels and earned success, it's also good to remember its lesser-loved but also awesome sibling, which, in spite of not seeing the same levels of love, still has a lot to offer on its own terms. Even looking at things more generally, this is the best place to play both Bayonetta and Vanquish on a home console. Moreover, these are two games that have stood the test of time in many ways, and are still a blast to experience. If you're looking for fun, challenging action, distilled into its purest and most jovial form, look no further than this collection. Add to this the fact that they're great ports, and have been released at a budget price, and really, there's very little reason for any fan of action games or shooters not to give this a go. In short, play these games, because they're fucking awesome.